tough act to follow. I got like, I had like a three of a kind in my hand with this outline cycle we had uh, last week. And then I come up and I got Ron Seminole, he's presenting on a 100 year cycle. <laughs> Somebody who's like strangled by his wife. And <laughs> so it's a good time to go to the bathroom, I guess. <laughs> I had two talks in mind. One was a deep slab cycle we had two years ago. And then this more recent wet, wet cycle. And just for the sake of time, I'm going to do just one. I've got a lot to talk about with this one. It's a pretty exciting avalanche cycle for us. I think the most remarkable thing was we all got pretty surprised several different times throughout the cycle, and um, some learning opportunities came from it. This is a photo we took uh, probably like 10 days of temps in the 60s down the valleys um, after three or four nights without a refreeze down there. And this is a, on the highway warning about ice on the roadway still. And, uh, the point of this is that sometimes we miss things as public safety communicators, and this is one of those that we, we missed a few, and I could come up here and kind of pound my chest about all the ones that we've gotten right, um, but this is one I think we've, we all, all four of us, like, were kicking ourselves several times throughout this week of what things that we could have done better at, so I, rather than, um, you know, take, uh, I'd like to take this week of learning that we had and just spell it down into 30 minutes, and maybe we can help folks in the future. Um, I know every time we present graphs at these things, someone <laughs> apologizes for graphs, but I think we're all snow scientists. We can all kind of understand graphs, except for a couple of people in the room, maybe Doug. Um, so I'm dumbing it down a bit with some emojis, and then I found out that Doug actually doesn't even have a smartphone, doesn't know what emoji is, probably. <laughs> so I went to selfies. Um, no, so I'm going to walk you through the progression of the season. Um, this is, as a director, I've seen this pattern happen every single year. So November, we're coming off of ISSW or Snow and Avalanche workshops, and we're feeling pretty nerdy, and morale's pretty good. And then it starts to snow, and we start to see avalanches happening, so we get a little bit more excited. And then. By January, we're, we're just choking on the powder up there. Um, this is about kind of the peak of things. And then we start to get a little bit tired. Um, maybe your house burns down and things like that. Um, March comes around and everyone's getting pretty rough space. And then there's a, a threshold that once you fall below that, you uh, like, Terminal breakups happen, divorces, all that stuff happens. So, <laughs> as a director of an avalanche center, we really hope for a high pressure ridge as a sort of inflection point <laughs> so that we don't drop below that threshold before the season ends. And high pressure ridge, I've seen a lot of them in March, late February, early March, and they're usually like it's kind of a nice week to catch up on projects and catch up on sleep. And so, beginning of this week, this is an email that I sent out to my staff on Saturday titled Recovery Week. Um, and I'll, you can read through, I highlight probably the most important thing was, it seems like at least by Monday we'll be probably back to low danger every morning, rising the wet, loose, moderate under the warming trend until the snow surface has been worked over. Focus on like catching up on sleep, you know, I think I said something about working on your tans. Um, basically catching up, catching up on projects. I'm like the cool boss, you know. Um, <laughs> This is about five days later, some of the times <laughs> looking at uh, D3.5, there's a D4 in there, and oops. <laughs> this is Friday of the recovery week in an avalanche morning in effect, and that's me <laughs> sitting at home. Uh, this is one of those, I think, classic baseball bat and ball things where I have aced every math test since I was a young kid, but I swore that bat cost a dollar and the ball cost 10 cents and hindsight's 20, 20. Um, this is what I expected to happen. We had a similar warm up last year in March and this is what we saw. D1s, D2, wet loose avalanches involving surface instabilities. Um, and that was sort of what I was thinking we had going into that week. So what happened? Um, start with a background of our snowpack to bring it up to speed. So this is snow water across Montana. We were a below average, but not that bad. We didn't have any real prolonged dry spells. You can look at that, that's noisy basin there. Um, consistent snowfall through the year. 
Uh, started off kind of dry up until mid-November and then, or late November, and then uh, fairly steady snowfall, but not quite as much as we normally expect to see. Uh, we had our usual early season wheat layers. Uh, this is a snow pit in November, and by December we were seeing slides breaking on those layers. Uh, this was a ski patroller was caught and buried in the slide. I uh, was doing a ski cut, I believe, at Big Mountain. Um, as the season progressed, larger and larger persistent slabs. This is January 5th. We had a, this is outside of our forecast area, but sort of representative of maybe the more shallow parts of our forecast area where we, um, at Avalanche Fatality, this is a big persistent slab ran across the slope, um, killed one snowmobiler. Um, and then the same day we had a snow biker fell right off of this cornice. Cornice fell underneath him. He tumbled down the hill. Uh, triggered, consequently, I don't know if the cornice like triggered a handful of persistent slabs. And those were kind of our last persistent slabs on the ground that we saw. Um, we, sometime in mid-January, we pulled it off the list. I think we might have had a couple more um, subsequent ones, but by, by about mid-January, we had taken that off the list. Uh, we had a surface sort event in mid-January that was sort of the focus for a while, but that kind of quickly disappeared. And then our big um, persistent week layer was what we call Groundhog's Day crust. Um, another graph here, so I'm going to just show you an emoji for Doug. I'll go back. Um, 40 degrees temps leading into that. We had um, some sun involved with it. We didn't actually get a rain event with it. It was just warm temps like a melt freeze crust. And then right after that, um, right on February 2nd, we got an Arctic air blast came through and temperature dropped. You can see about 40 degrees over the course of a few hours. Uh, and we got some near surface facets that came in with that. So here's a look at our Groundhog's Day crust. Um, kind of a facet crust facet sandwich. Most places there's a melt freeze crust on sunny slopes that extended. Most of it was at mid and lower elevations. In some areas on sunny slopes that extended all the way into the Alpine. Uh, we had a avalanche warning, avalanche cycle in mid February that produced uh, pretty widespread activity. I wouldn't say widespread on you know a lot of slopes, but there, certainly not all of them. Um, persistent slabs, anywhere from five feet in the bigger parts of our range to a couple of feet in sort of the shallower spots. Uh, the worst part about this cycle is it was ripping people's heads off out there. It's a bad joke. It's no real helmet. Um, <laughs> and then February 20th, we had a skier caught and carried in a D3 persistent slab. Um, that was south facing slope, mid elevations, that same Groundhog's Day crust. About a three foot slab that broke pretty widely and was, was pretty scary. So, moving along, things started to heal up, and this is uh, a look at what we had going into the warm up. Rope and Rescue Creek, about 5,000 feet in elevation. Here's our Groundhog's Day crust. It's down about three feet now underneath a persistent slab. We are seeing that slab actually starting to erode just because of cold temperatures and starting to facet. The weak layers above it, gaining strength. They don't look that weak, but we still are getting a mix of propagating and non-propagating results. That's consistent with what we're finding around the advisory area, and that's why we've rated it unlikely. There still are maybe some slopes that we're worried about, but more so if we get additional loading, still potential for this layer to wake up again. Our big concern today is we're looking for fresh wind loading. Today in the northern whitefish range, we got treated to views of some impressive avalanche carnage that likely ran during our mid-February avalanche warning. It appears as if persistent slabs on the Groundhog Day crust connected across several start zones and flushed debris across the road and across Hay Creek. The slides terminated at their historic runouts and in some places snapped mature trees. Fortunately, the snowpack has evolved and adjusted since then, and today we found that the persistent slab structure was unreactive. What we're seeing as we're just riding around, our, our tracks are tunneling deeper into the snow. It's just the slab is starting to break I down. It's fastening away. So this <laughs> persistent slab we're talking about pulled it off the list up here because the slab is just decaying. We do have weak, fast and snow. Almost our entire snowpack now, except for the last 10 or so inches that fell on Friday. So right here, it's pretty incohesive. Uh, not, not a concern, we feel comfortable riding on steep terrain one at a time, but as we gain elevation we're going to be watching out for areas where this snow is a little bit thicker and denser from wind drifting. 
So the reason the snow is so weak is because we've had such cold weather all month and a lot of clear skies like this. So when you get clear, cold nights, clear skies, uh, you get faceting in the snowpack. So again, that's pretty good for stability now because we don't have that slab. Once we put more weight on it, things will change. So that was leading up until early March. And you know, early March we started focusing mostly just on shallow wind slabs, storm instabilities that were forming up high and um, sort of let the persistent slab problem go for a little while. Um, before I kind of move into the next part, I thought I'd give a synopsis of like some guidance that we use for wet loose avalanche. So I mean, we get wet loose avalanches a lot. Um, but it's kind of, it's a hard one to, I think, put a danger rating on because the likelihood is always kind of sort of falls under high. Like wet loose avalanches are likely or very likely almost any time the sun comes out for us. Um, so we kind of have this sort of guidance for where does it fall on the danger scale? Obviously when you're getting small wet loose avalanches happening all over the place, it's still a pretty safe day to go out and play around. You just gotta avoid specific features. So following underneath, under these sort of guidance, we'd, we'd come up with sort of our own sort of criteria to just help in the morning of like set a, establish some sort of consistency between our staff. Um, we've never even talked about what it takes to go to high because we'd always just fallen in this um, low to moderate zone right there uh, and considerable. So then, this is kind of early mid-March here, we had a small wet loose cycle and sun came out for a couple days. We had a crest form on southerlies that subsequently got buried by up to 8 to 12 inches of new snow on that uh, March 10th crest. Uh, March 14th we saw warming coming down the pipes. We started sort of public messaging in our social media and on our forecast about um, potential for large wet loose avalanches when the sun comes out. Uh, we actually had one day where we rated it considerable, thinking we are going to see a wet loose cycle in the clouds. Um, stayed over the whole time and we didn't see anything happen, so we were crying wolf. Um, anyways, this is a, a look at some of the activity that happened during that first, um, first sun break and pretty unimpressive for what, what we have potential for. And we'll look at Saturday, March 16th. This is when I think we kind of started our, warm, our recovery week, as I like to call it. Um, <laughs> And the format here, I'll go through um, the next seven days and put the day up there and then our bottom line that we wrote in our forecast advisory that day with the danger rating, um, what the weather forecast was, sort of what actually happened that day and then what we observed. And of course, a lot of this, the observed, was coming in a little bit later than, like we're going to see what happened now, but we weren't getting some of these odds until two, maybe three days later, so there's a little bit of... Um, but things to think about there. But anyways, um, first day, forecast was mostly cloudy, high of 33. Uh, what ended up happening was we saw a high of 38, the clouds broke, and we saw a uh, D1 wet loose with a few D2s. This is a photo that Blaze took looking over at Scoop Shoots, which is a popular zone right outside the ski resort, and um, not really much happening there. There was, Clancy was in the, another part that we saw a couple D1s and maybe a D2 or so that came down. Um, sort of what you would expect when the sun came out. And then this is the look at on um, Saturday. This is uh, the outlook that I was looking at. This is a multi-model um, forecast for temperatures and looking into our, our week ahead and highs kind of going into the, on average, starting off at low 30s and going up into the kind of upper 30s to low 40s. And then lows dropping into the sort of teens the first few nights and getting up into the 20s um, 20s throughout later in the week so that was when I declared recovery week for the Avalanche Center boys and at the same time Avcan issued a or they're in their kind of back end thing they were talking about issuing a, a special Avalanche warning and a L4 danger rating at all elevations on Monday and I was like a little eyes wide open when I saw that I was like what are we missing um, at the same time, Mark was out in the field and noticed a persistent slab that happened relatively recently. It looked like it was triggered maybe by like an ice fall or maybe some water drained off of an ice fall onto the slope. And so that kind of brought about that question, both between the spa that the Canadians were putting out in this persistent slab. We had sort of this impromptu discussion on Saturday afternoon, like what are we expecting with this warm up? Uh, should we be worried about the persistent slab structure waking up again? Kind of, I was like, wow, I think we're just going to see a bunch of wet loose and, uh, you know, 
pretty simple things. So everyone's kind of having having their 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 chat on it there, and I'll let you guys kind of read through the comments real quick. And basically, by the end of that discussion, we were like, well, there's still a lot of uncertainty of what's going to happen this week. I, I said, well, I guess we should all plan our regular field days, cover a lot of ground, um, seeing what's happening out there. I did, uh, whoops. <laughs> um, I reached out to Adam Clark, who's forecaster for BNSF, and asked him what he thought, and kind of this is his take on it as well. He basically had, to sum up, you can read through there as well, but he basically said, a lot of uncertainty going this week. There is some potential for deeper weak layers to wake up. Sometimes that doesn't happen. I think we're all on that, at that point with the weather forecast that we were looking at, we're thinking, well, we're gonna see some good freezes at night and we've got, um, you know, like it, it'll be kind of a slow progression of the warm up, and it won't be that bad. I asked Evan Ross, he's a buddy of mine in Crested Butte and uh, I've been on the phone with him like all month with their extreme cycle trying to help those guys and so I was like, you gotta help me out now, what do you think? And his take was maybe you should go to high danger because your avalanche problems are so boring. So, <laughs> uh, he also, actually his like feedback was similar to what Adam said. Um, so that was where we're at Sunday, level two danger rating. Um, you can read our bottom line there, the weather forecast was mostly cloudy, skies and a high of 37. What ended up happening was we had sort of a thin hazy cloud cover, a high of 42. Um, at that same time, we started messaging for the potential for buried weak layers to wake up. We didn't list it as an avalanche problem yet, but we, we uh, highlighted it in our discussion. And what we saw was a widespread D1 to D3 wet loose cycle. Um, it gouged down to the ground at low elevations. So I'll give a little tour of what, um, what we saw. And of course, like I said, some of these observations didn't come until later. This is one that we did see that day. This is Mark out in the field observing. Um, this is me two days later, came out, and this is where we first kind of got a sense that while wow, things uh, progressed quickly and it was already gouging down to the ground, uh, we're seeing D3s. It's kind of hard to get a sense of scale with a lot of these wet, um, wet debris photos, but well, some pretty monstrous ones you'll get to see in the next coming days. Um, more stuff from the Northern Whitefish Range, and over there on the right, that's from um, John F. Stevens Canyon. And Adam reported dozens of wet loose avalanches and a few that were gouging to the ground, like that one. Um, from the park, this is now two days later I got into the park to look, um, stuff gouging to the ground, and this is out early morning tour, and we saw that a 3.5 wet loose had come down off of Mount Vought on a day when we had moderate rain rating, so <laughs> that was kind of a bummer to see. Um, we go into Monday. Um, we should, that was a level three danger rating that day. Another day of warm sunny conditions. Forecast was for mostly clear, a high of 41. What transpired was uh, mostly clear, a high of 47. At that point, you can see the temperature graphs here and we're still getting good freezing. The first night was 25, the second night was maybe 26, 27. Clear sky, so with good radiation cooling and things were um, refreezing pretty well at night. So uh, what we saw was continued D1 to D3 wetness <coughs> activity. Uh, but a downturn in activity. A couple photos from that day. This is uh, the one on the right is Cannon Creek Road, which is a popular route for snowmobilers and backcountry skiers um, coming out of slack country out of the ski resort. And a pretty significant slide there. Some of these slides are pretty hard to put a date on, but I wanted to throw some pictures in. This is sort of the type of activity I was, you know, I expected was happening on that day. It's hard to really pin down a date, but we were seeing some interesting slides in sort of dense timber that were breaking trees um, in areas that you wouldn't maybe normally expect. So then Tuesday, um, so L2 danger rating, our reasoning that day, so I was, that was a day with me and Mark, uh, the day before we had talked about going to considerable this day, and then the morning of, we saw a sort of down, downtrend in activity from the day before, we looked at the InfoX on Canada, they were reporting just some ones and a couple twos. And we're like, maybe the surface has worked over and maybe we're on the downside of this wet, wet loose cycle. Um, the forecasted high was for a few degrees warmer than yesterday. Not that bad. Um, one thing that I think is an important consideration is it got down to 32 that night instead of into the 20s. Um, what ended up happening is we saw temps skyrocket. They, they basically rose about 
I think 14 degrees higher than the day before, uh, 10 degrees higher than forecasted. Again, actually these highs, the highs that I'm reporting here from the, the NAM nest model, um, the highs that we were getting from NOAA were actually probably like three to five degrees lower than that even. So um, we were seeing highs that were hitting 15 degrees higher than the, no the forecast that we were getting from NOAA. Um, that day we added persistent slabs as a low likelihood problem on our forecast advisory. Uh, what we ended up seeing was an increase in D2, D3 wet loose activity and then wet slab activity started in earnest that day. Um, the ski resort had a natural D2.5 wet slab that occurred in open terrain. Fortunately it happened after everyone was off the lifts and the terrain was closed. It happened right at sunset. Um, so we'll take a look at some of the carnage. Um, this one is, I threw it in there, I'm not exactly sure on the timing of these slides. I observed them these, this day, I think they probably maybe were the day before. These were actually, appeared to be dry slabs that were triggered by some kind of warning where I'm thinking there was probably water coming and channeling in through the rocks, but actually dry hard slabs in those situations. Um, this is from above the railway, uh, the guys are BNSF uh, D3 wet slab. You can see here, triggered by a wet loose that came down and went to the ground and came all the way down pretty close to the rail. Um, they didn't spot that until the next day. Uh, I think they were also surprised to see this amount of activity go at this level in the warm-up. So um, a couple more, here's another D3 that came down, wet loose, maybe a wet slab, um, debris terminated within 100 yards of the shed. So they were getting nervous. Um, this is at the ski resort. And this is our first sort of indication that what slab problem was happening was, uh, like, like I said, those, the, the slides, the previous ones here, we weren't getting, we didn't get these obs until a couple days later. Um, but this is our first observation. The wet slab came in the next morning as we were putting our forecast together. And we had gotten this photo from Adam that that happened midday on that day and starting to kind of show some characteristics of slabbing out. Um, neither of these were that. I wouldn't call that impressive of wet slabs yet, but sort of indicating that we're heading that direction. And then Wednesday, um, we should have L3 danger rating. Here, here comes the hottest day so far. Weather forecast was clear, high 47. What happened was another 10 degrees hotter than expected. Um, we added the wet slab problem that day. We saw an increase in D2, D3 wet loose and wet slabs. Um, WMAR closed all their sun affected terrain that day. They went out with explosives that afternoon and triggered a couple of deep, they rated 2.5 to 3 wet slabs uh, that ran down into groomed trails. Um, so, looking over at our temperatures, here was our first, to me, our first really poor refreeze. This was a 32, and then this, this night was, um, looks like it dipped down into like 38 for a couple hours, but mostly it was hovering at 40 for most of the night. So you can see it's not freezing at night like we had sort of anticipated early on in the week. Um, interesting stuff, let's see what that looked like. Uh, just some more carnage above the railway here. This is the D3 that terminated 200 yards from the rail. Um, and some more just mess just going down to the ground. Uh, look at that one, it's just like dirt showing. Um, again, they couldn't see the runouts on these, so estimating a 2.5 or a 3. Here's, uh, I got some video footage from the boys at w WMR. They, were, they used a 20 pound info shot on this. This is area that control all winter long, skier compacted all winter long. Listen to the trees snapping, it's good. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, that's the biggest avalanche I've ever set. This is another look looking down at that debris pile. Ski Patrol took that photo, and then um, this is a photo I snapped the next day looking over at it. Again, kind of down to the ground. That one's stepped down. They said it started out the Groundhog's Day crust and then stepped down to the ground. Um, 
So we'll go into Thursday. Uh, we issued a level four avalanche danger rating. And here was the forecast. I'll, I'll kind of run you through everything. Um, another night with a poor refreeze, that time only down to 40. Weather forecast was for clear, high of 50, and we saw it go up to 57. And that was our peak in, as far as I can tell, our peak in wet instabilities. Um, we saw a D3 even one that I categorize as close to D4, um, full depth wet loose and wet slab avalanches. Um, WMR continues terrain, terrain closures. Uh, they continue to get wet slab results with explosive testing. They had an inbounds, um, basically a closed terrain, a, a group of snowboarders poached one of the closed terrain, triggered a wet slab that then ran down into a groomed run. Fortunately, nobody was caught and there were no people down below. Um, we issued an avalanche watch that day, and then the BNSF issued an avalanche watch, which is a pretty serious thing for them. That means um, some significant cutbacks, I think, on rail operations. And that's, that's sort of, I put that sort of synonymous with an avalanche warning for us. So um, pretty serious when those guys threw out a watch. Here's some of the carnage. Um, this is the accidental snowboard triggered at the ski resort, D2.5 wet slab um, in closed terrain. This is, according to Lloyd, triggered 20 feet from a 15 pound Ampho shot the day before. Uh, the debris ran down to the groomer. Uh, this is over in Canyon Creek, and Canyon Creek is another popular side country area, and we saw uh, a lot of carnage. Some of the timing of this, you'll see, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but um, stuff was coming down on this day, on the day before. There, it was just kind of a mess. Uh, some pretty big, wet goobers coming down onto this road, that, which is probably the most heavily trafficked road in our entire forecast area. Um, so it's sort of a big deal when that's happening. Looking up at our Alpine, we we're seeing slides go down to the ground. This is on Great Northern. Uh, pretty impressive stuff up there. This is a couple days, or the next day I was out on a tour in this area, we're seeing just carnage everywhere. And again, some of the timing on this is hard to tell for sure, but I think a lot of this was happened on Thursday. Um, more wet debris piles here. Clancy and I did a drive around that afternoon and we had a good sense of what was happening. That was our, our first time that we were out in the afternoon watching it come down and it was impressive to see stuff just that was just down on the ground. Um, more carnage here, stuff is gross. <laughs> Yeah, you can see, and this is, this is almost 65 or almost 7,000 feet in elevation, which is almost our mountaintops. Um, we're seeing stuff, slides, wet loose avalanches, breaking all the way down the ground, um, wet slabs. So then Friday, all of us were in on the forecast conversation that morning. We were, we were all kind of uncertain about what was going to happen next, but we we're all on board with putting out an avalanche warning. Um, our thought was most of our wet slab activity at that point had been at mid elevations, and we we're like, well, today's the day it goes up to the upper elevations, and we see like the big alpine bowls all start to come down. And um, that didn't really come to fruition. It's sort of a downturn in activity. On that day, we did, the freeze was slightly better than the night before, although not much. So we're going on basically like three nights of a really crappy freeze. High temperatures were a little bit cooler than the last um, few days there. And uh, WMR continued their terrain closures. They continued to get wet slab results. We had our avalanche warning out. The BNSF also reissued an avalanche watch. They sort of canceled it that night when things cooled, or the previous night, and then they reissued again that afternoon. So. Um, Everyone was nervous that, that that day didn't play out as exciting, I think, as we had all hoped, but um, still some more activity. This is one that happened that day off of Stanton, which these are big, long running paths. I bet this is a 3,000 or 4,000 foot, uh, probably 3,000 foot run from the top and some pretty mass, messy piles at the bottom once it gets down there. So I thought I'd just take a kind of look at some of the um, results as an overview of what we had that week. Um, this is a graph that Eric made for me today. It was really cool to see. Um, this just sort of shows the increase in size as the week went on um, and the, the activity. I think 
Um, one sort of bias here is that we were seeing D1 and D2s this side of the week too, but we sort of stopped recording those in our database because it was just getting so messy. It's really hard to tell when things were running at that point. Um, but I think this, this is sort of a good output of showing this is that temperature trend. This is on Big Mountain, which is at, I should have said this right at the beginning, this is at almost 7,000 feet, 6,800 feet. Um, I put an avalanche index, which is basically I was just multiplied the D scale by the, um, by the, the number of avalanche occurrences. And again, I think there's a bit of a bias. I think we're seeing a lot more, we saw a lot more activity here that we didn't really document because it was just like, who cares? It's another D2. Um, and then this is our forecast of danger ratings that week. And if I were going to go back and uh, hindcast what I think happened, I think we were close to level four on this day, actually. But overall, I think like we peaked on that on the 22nd there. And that's sort of, we kind of came in soft and then we finished. And this is a classic forecasting example that we, we tend to be a little bit behind on some of these forecasts. Um, so I thought I'd talk about what some of the complicating factors and some of our strategies. We had a nice debrief after this cycle and what, what could we do differently as a team to kind of prevent these things from happening. So uh, the first thing I think that we overlooked was the snowpack in the tracks and runouts of our starting zones, um, or of our, sorry, of our avalanche paths. And we had an abnormally cold low density snowpack compared to what we're kind of used to in the Flathead Valley. Usually we get these kind of southwest flows that come in with a freezing level somewhere between two to four to maybe 5,000 feet. So we see at some point in the winter, we, we have warm-ups and we have small wet loose cycles that then create crust and create more of a mature wet snowpack. This year, if you look at, um, this is from Cal Spell, you can see that this is the norm, the green is the norm. And from basically from February on till mid-March, we were well below average for temperatures. We actually never had a day that rose above freezing after that February 2nd event. And then this warm-up wasn't a particularly rare warm-up. It was, if you look at it, it fell right in the average for this time of, uh, type of year. But I think the, the main thing was that, you know, uh, snowpack doesn't like to be shocked. And it came from a very cold snowpack to a warm, a relative strong temperature gradient there that happened, like a temperature spike. And that was sort of, a, I think, a big, a big thing. And, you know, we had been focusing the whole month of March, we've been focusing on wind slabs and instabilities up high, and that was where all of our uncertainty for forecast was. So we just sort of cruised right by our low elevations. We knew what the snowpack was there. It wasn't that we didn't know, but we, our, our minds were absorbed in what was going on up high. And where all the activity happened kind of at mid and lower elevations, at least starting off. Um, so our strategy there is just closer monitoring of low elevations with warm up and closer monitoring of valley temperatures. Again, we, we were looking a lot at upper elevation temperatures. Um, and of course, we're still looking at valley temps, but I think there was more emphasis on, on our upper elevations and that, you know, that first warm up when it came in on Saturday and Sunday, it was pretty hot down the valley. Um, another one was the under forecasted warming. Again, sure, this was the outlook at the beginning of the week with highs in the 40s, lows in the 20s, and what ended up happening was highs in the upper 50s and lows in the, in the 40s by the end of the week. So the weather models kind of struggled with this high pressure ridge. Um, in some, in some cases, they were 15 degrees off. So that's pretty um, interesting to see. There was some comment. I, I chatted with some of the NOAA folks, and there was a comment that maybe some of the weather or the temperature sensors aren't reading exactly accurate because of like stagnant air. That's something to consider. So maybe we weren't, we weren't actually seeing highs in 57, but I know our, our temperatures were definitely warmer than um, forecasted. Um, and then we blew some cloud cover forecasts early on. And I won't go into the details there for the sake of time, but uh, there were some, we got some additional cloud forecasting resources. Um, I'd say don't get anchored to seasonal expectations, especially with global weirding. Um, I think we all were thinking March, not, not as hot as April, May, but it sure was. Um, and then scrutinize temp forecasts to actuals. I think it wasn't until about Wednesday or Thursday that I was like, man, our models are blowing the forecast and the, the temperature forecast and we need to just adjust what we're forecasting for. Um, another kind of major complicating thing is we were having these overlapping events going on everywhere. It was really hard to get a timeline of when things were happening. For the first few days, we were struggling to tell, like, is it getting worse or better? Like, are these avalanches, when did they run? Did they all run it? Because we knew everything ran pretty, like, we knew we had a pretty good cycle on Sunday. So the, the question was, like, 
is it now getting worse or better? What's happening out there? And we go to some location, we just see a pile of wet debris, and we're like, when did that run? Um, so, you know, some of our strategies are, are returning to control points so that we can get a good sense of how it's evolving at, at one location and documenting that terrain with, with photos. Um, and then um, one, one tool that I found useful later on in the week is we started seeing more and more slides go to the ground. And once you start seeing the ground show up, it's easier to date things because the first you know, day that it runs to the ground, there's kind of like a white track across the slope where it ran down and then that, that white track melts out to dirt the next day. So you can look at a patch of dirt and you know that it ran at least 24 hours ago. If you look at that thing and you can see white on it, then it probably ran more recently. So that was a useful tool. Um, delayed feedback was another challenge for us. Uh, slides were happening later and later in the day as the cycle went on. And we were seeing slides that happened overnight, even like 6 p.m., 7 p.m., um, you know, well beyond when we're out in the field. And so we were basically working off of two-day-old data, trying to predict what's happening off of what happened two days ago. We'd go out in the morning and you could see slides that happened two days ago, or, you know, it's just it complicated things, not, not seeing, uh, not getting our, our, like, our evening feedback that we'd like to get. So we, sort of towards the end of the week, we started changing our strategy to we'd go driving in the afternoon to look at things as they were coming down that afternoon. Um, and then really useful was having the BNSF who was basically monitoring their terrain until sundown. And WMR was you know, there at least till 4 or 5 p.m. So that was helpful to get feedback from them. Because um, yeah, our, our routine is to be out in the field and then be back by, you know, by 4 or so and be documenting. And then the biggest thing is, um, Wet snow forecasting is just challenging. There's the timing of meltwater and when it comes down. And um, I think in this case, the water moved a lot faster than we expected and kind of address some of those reasons already with the cold snowpack. Um, I think what we really did well this whole week, whole week like our travel advice was following, it was like, when it gets hot, move to shady slopes. Move to shady slopes when it gets hot. And, and we, we, we drummed that in people and we didn't have any close calls that week other than the stuff that happened at WMR. So um, a couple thresholds for, for this cycle, I thought the first day of snow wetting, which is sort of an easy one um, to talk about, although on this day it was a hard one because the cloud forecast got blown. Um, first day of temps above 50 and a marginal refreeze was another sort of spike and then the third night without a refreeze seemed to be our, our one. Another strategy for wet snow forecasting is just go to close up shop and go to Cancun. <laughs> um, got a few more slides I want to Go through really quickly. Um, Eric put this together for me just a couple days ago. They have a time lapse camera on Skook Shoots, which is south facing terrain. A lot of popular backcountry skiing goes right into the canyon, and then you have to hike out this canyon, so it's a terrain trap underneath all these south facing slopes. They have a, a camera pointing up there, and I'll just kind of cruise through these. Um, first wet slab happened on Monday, March 18th, and it's six, a pretty small little guy. Oh, slow down. Um, tiny little guy right at sunset. Then the next day, this is uh, Tuesday, March 19th, at right around 3 p.m. And then a bigger one popped out. And then this was probably the first D3 happened on that same day around 4 p.m. So thanks for hosting us today. Um, <laughs> And big thanks to my staff um, and let me throw them under the bus on this one. This is a really hard cycle and anyone want to come ski with us this spring? <laughs> <laughs> Happy to answer any questions or comments. <laughs> did uh, Ave Canada, did they have a big cycle that same week you did? I mean, they kept it at high, all elevation, all, every single day, which... Um, and did they actually have avalanches? They were getting a lot of D1s and D2 loose wet. Um, trying to think if there were any, uh, I mean, up to 2.5, I'm sure they were seeing some D3s. Um, did you guys... I remember seeing D2 bobs. Oh. Yeah, I don't think I saw one bigger than a 2.5. They, they did get like a deep slab on the north facing one early in the week way north of our forecast area. Um, yeah, so like from what I saw in their info it wasn't as exciting as what we got. 
they also missed out on the 12 inches we got to the roof before. I think they didn't have that additional part. Yeah. Did they have the crust down low, the ground down? They didn't advertise as much as we did. I, I don't think so. Like they had a surface hoar issue that they were worried about, but we, I think we were warmer, we're, you know, further south, and we had that, that Groundhog's Day crust, and they didn't, they weren't really talking about that. I mean, their advisories all winter, so I think their, their issues, their persistent issues were stuff on the ground and the surface hoar layer, and so, I, yeah, I guess they didn't really have that same structure either. Once we kind of got really in the thick of it here, it kind of started to lose track of what was happening up there. And we had plenty of evidence that things were going off in our neck of the woods, so we just stopped paying attention. Yeah, <laughs> had our hands full. What elevation were you finding that, that groundhog day crust or vast layer? Yeah, it was up to about 6,200 feet on all aspects, six or 62. And then, like I said, on some um, southerly slopes, it was higher than that. It, we, didn't have a, we didn't have it well documented how high it was because it kind of happened on a single day or two event, and then it got buried really quickly, and we were in a cycle. So we didn't get to like check out a whole lot of high elevations. You had to be on a steep slope because it was a sun. On, at high elevations, it was a sun baked issue, and we just couldn't access that terrain safely. Yeah. For all those piles in Canyon Creek uh, naturals, or were they yeah. skier triggered? All naturals. Yeah. Okay. Well, as far as I know. Yeah. I think you'd be crazy to be over there skiing that at two in the afternoon, but who knows? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Thanks, Zach. Yeah.